welcome everybody today to one of our external um, seminars from our external seminar series. Um, today we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Beatriz Hambrina Canseco. Um, uh, she's going to present a paper um, that is titled The Stories We Tell Ourselves, a local newspaper reporting and support for the radical right. Um, Beatriz is a PhD candidate in economic geography uh, and a researcher at the International Inequalities Institute uh, at the LSC in London. Uh, her main research areas include applied labor and regional economics, with an emphasis on the political and economic consequences associated with spatial inequalities. And she is currently working in two separate projects. The first one focused on the political impact of perceptions regarding regional disparities in Spain. And the second deals with rising, the rising importance of non-standard employment and its effect on wages and long-term labor market. Um, labor market outcomes in uh, urban areas. Sorry. Beatriz uh, has previously held positions at the OECD, at uh, the Fourcier Consulting, uh, the European Commission, and also uh, several uh, non-governmental uh, uh, organizations. So uh, Beatriz, uh, the floor is yours. And, um, and, and please uh, uh, keep your time around 30, 35 minutes to allow some questions and also um, uh, um, yes, to allow questions and comments at the end of your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Beatriz. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Raquel, and um, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming. I'm actually very excited to present this uh, paper. I'm actually I'm going to share my screen uh, so that you can see it. Um, the idea is to, hopefully you can see this. Um, Whoops, sorry. Um, the idea is to um, send it for publication very soon. So um, I'm still able to um, adapt any advice that you may have. So feel free to provide comments and whatever else you might want. Also, feel free to interrupt me. I know that usually you keep comments towards the end, but if you have any questions or any suggestions, I'm more than happy to take them and to just interrupt me as I'm speaking. Okay. so. Um, the way that I envisage this going is um, I'm going to be talking obviously about the rise of the radical rights in Europe and so I'm going to start with some introduction and motivation for this topic and why we care about this basically. Um, what the situation looks like a bit in Spain just so that you have a bit of a framework um, and what the current literature says. And then I'm going to walk you through what I'm doing. I'm using a machine learning algorithm to classify articles into topics uh, and then using this to gauge perception. I'll say more about this later. And this is um, with the whole goal of answering the question, well, why do people vote for radical right parties? Um, so let's start. Um, in a nutshell, uh, what I'm going to be saying is, is going to be very well known to all of you. There has been a rise uh, in the vote for radical right parties over the, well, since the 80s, technically, but in particular over the last 10 years. And this is not, people are particularly worried about this, not necessarily only because of the vote, but because it's become very prevalent. It happens kind of across Europe here. You have it like across EU member countries and you see how the numbers go up. And there is an ever increasing number of parties um, that are becoming kind of very pervasive. And I can show you kind of the same thing with uh, just this map that has the share of radical right representatives. And if you think about this, it's just uh, distribution split in quintiles. So the darker the color, the higher the quintile. Um, and you see two things. First of all, at least across Europe, it's a pretty widespread phenomenon. It's not like there's countries where this doesn't happen. Um, and perhaps the reason why most academics and most of civil society is worried about this it's not that there's radical right parties per se, it's because um, the topics that they pursue kind of become part of the mainstream. It gets to a point where, where their agendas are so prevalent um, that mainstream parties start adopting some of these features. And you might think of this as something that happened with Brexit, uh, where UKIP was pushing for certain ideas and then all of, all of a sudden these ideas kind of become common and mainstream and fine. Uh, so this is kind of in general why we care. Um, there has been a lot of literature on this, and you will see that most of that literature, although increasingly has become more local, is very national. But if I show you 
the share of the vote for different parties here for the Front National in France and for Alternative für Deutschland in Germany, you see that there's very regionalized patterns that are very, very clear. A very similar pattern happens in Italy with Lega in, in 2018, and it also happens in Spain. So this is not really, I mean, there are regional features that are important here. The case of Spain is particularly interesting because there are um, five autonomous communities, so five of our, of our regions, where you see that the, low, the vote is much lower. And this you can see clearly from the map, uh, Galiz, the Basque Country, Navarre, Catalonia, and the Canary Islands all have lower shares of the vote. And, and this, it, you might say, well, this is due to historical issues, this is due to political party, like on the supply side. And that would make sense. But what is quite striking is that in that map that I'm showing you, white stands for basically null, whereas the darker the color is, it goes up to 60% of the vote in certain municipalities. And if you see it, it doesn't really align with administrative boundaries. There's municipalities with really high shares of the vote that are kind of all over. So it cannot really be institutional features or necessarily administrative things that are driving this. And, and you can see bits of this also in other countries, so although it's perhaps not as clear as it is in this Spanish map. Um, so this is what I'm gonna be kind of focusing on. Um, just to give you a bit of background to so that you understand what the radical right means in Spain, because it's not quite, it has some similarities with other radical right parties, but it's also slightly different. So I've split, what I've done is take uh, tweets from Vox, which is our um, radical right party, um, and kind of highlighting some of the key messages that they focus on. There is definitely a push for immigration, and this is gonna this is shared across Europe. What is quite interesting is that uh, if you see that tweet, is very much about um, you know issues with people crossing over from Morocco Ill illegally or not illegally. Um, but this is something that is not actually in their political manifesto, but does show up on Twitter. And this I'm going to come back to later as uh, like in the interest of Twitter as a means of explaining this issue. Uh, they also focus very much on economic development and employment. And this is not necessarily only for the radical right. It kind of happens across a lot of uh, spectrum of, of Spanish parties. They focus a lot on nationalism as well, and rather a re-centralization of Spain, which is de facto a federal state. So there is very much a push against this. And then there is also a push for traditional values and for the values of rural communities and this type of idea. And you can see how this links up with the literature that you might be very familiar with, which is, um, I can maybe summarize very quickly, the initial literature was very much focused, it was called the economic anxiety versus cultural backlash debate. And this is very much kind of at the national level. And it's this idea that is gonna sound incredibly familiar of, well, what is happening is that there's globalization and modernization and things are changing. And this is creating grievances because it's creating winners and losers in society. And what political parties do is take those grievances and use them to, to gather votes, basically. And so far, political scientists agree. Where people disagree is there's people who are saying, well, this is really due to an economic circumstance of unemployment, of um, automation, of competition from China, all of these things that are damaging individual economic conditions. And this is what is driving the vote. And then there's other people who say, well, yes, there is an economic thing, but it's not really that. It's really very much about values and what I was saying about traditional values and the importance of you know, being invaded, if you will, by the other who is eroding this identity that we used to have. Um, this is from the national perspective. And then at some point later in the literature, people started realizing that there were regional and local patterns as well. And so um, some authors, among them Rodriguez Posse, started proposing um, this idea of the geography of discontent, which is very much, it's kind of associated to the economic argument in a sense that it's economic in nature, but it's not really about me being deprived myself because I am unemployed. It is rather about living in a place that used to be doing well, but now because of the forces of agglomeration, because of cities, because, um, because that's where jobs agglomerate and where money is, um, my region is doing worse. And I feel like my place of birth or where I live is being left behind. And this is causing resentment that may have pushed people to vote for the radical right. And all of these things are, I mean, they sound very plausible and feasible. And there's a gigantic debate where people go in favor of one or in favor of the other. What I try to do here with this paper is to 
try to answer this question, which one of these is more important? And to do so, I propose that we should look at geographical differences in newspaper reporting. And why do I say this? Because the main idea is that newspaper reporting in a particular area, and I mean local newspapers, national newspapers, everything that you read in that particular area is kind of not necessarily driving the narrative, but showing an equilibrium of between supply and demand of news. And this is in part why I look at Twitter. I mean, I look at Twitter for two reasons. The first, first one is that it's, I cannot get access to all articles um, across Spain for a single year. And that's something that just I, I haven't been able to do. But the second advantage of Twitter is that actually, it, this is well known. I mean, it is well known that the media affects public perception, but what there is more and more research on is that also the media is now catering to in order to get clicks. And Twitter is very much a space where you see this, where what I'm assuming is that newspapers tweet about their most important articles, which is something that I, that I can actually check that they do. Um, and so then what I, would be, what I would be seeing when I look at Twitter is this equilibrium between supply, new supply and news demand. And so it's a, it's a good way, or this is what I'm proposing, that it is a good way of understanding what people in a particular area think about all of these issues or about which issues are more prevalent. And there's some issues um, with the algorithm that I'm using that do not allow me to look at sentiment. I will talk about this um, a bit later. Um, so of course, the main challenge, I haven't mentioned this, the main challenge is evidently that I cannot have a causal specification because it's, I mean, it's really hard to gauge causality, right? And this is why this is such a big debate. Um, okay, so let me try to tell you what data I have. So what I've done is um, mine data from Twitter for absolutely all tweets that are, each of those is associated to an article for all Spanish newspapers, and that's 121 of them um, at any level. So national, regional, all the way to very, very local. Um, and you end up, I end up with over 2 million tweets. And because of computing capacity, I just took a 10% random sample and run the analysis on that. And then I use, what I'm doing is trying to figure out what these tweets, so what these articles are about um, and classify them into topics to then attach them to these um, cultural backlash, economic anxiety, geography of discontent um, ideas. Uh, I also have information on newspaper readership and this is going to become important, particularly in terms of national newspapers, because they have a very clear political slant. Um, and I want to be able to control for this. Um, and then I have some actual real data, real level municipality data on turnout, on election results, population, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let me tell you first kind of how the algorithm works. This is, so you might already know um, quite a bit about um, text analysis. This is one of the big proposals of the paper that you can use text analysis to gauge this type of idea. To do so, I start with, uh, these are some of the examples that I manually labeled. So for example, the first one says, um, hell on earth um, for the sect of the Miguelians. I don't even know what this means, but this is clearly about religion. Um, and what I'm doing before I even undertake any analysis, there is this idea of tokenization. So basically creating a giant matrix where at the top you have columns of words and then rows that belong to each tweet. And I, it just kind of counts how many times each word appears. I'm going to take away stop words and stop words are just words that don't convey any particular meaning. There's dictionaries for this. So for example, if I say the book is expensive, the and is are not particularly helpful in conveying information. Um, and in the same form, you use stem words. So, and stemming is just that, for example, in Spanish, words have gender, so they're either masculine or feminine. Um, what this does is just take the root so that they don't count, you don't count them as separate things when they're not separate things. Uh, so this is just like a pre-processing. And then I actually manually labeled 10,000 tweets, as you can see, um, in a lot of, I mean, for example, here, the second one says uh, something along the lines of the, um, I don't even know the translation of this, <laughs> the surplus uh, for the social security grows up to 17% uh, up till June, for example. This is clearly about economics. Uh, so I take a list and end up with this list of topics that is very long. You can see the topic prevalence across the whole country. And the ones that I want you to focus on, so you see that I am just classifying as they come. And the only ones that I have clustered together are, for example, poverty and unemployment because the algorithm was having trouble distinguishing them separately. 
but as you can see, I'm interested for the cultural backlash argument, I'm interested in feminism and LGBTQ plus issues um, on immigration and the topic of religion. Then I attach poverty and unemployment to the economic anxiety argument. And for the geography of discontent, I have something that simply says lack of resources. And this could be any lack of resources. So there's no research, like there's no doctors, anything of that kind. And then stuff about depopulation and, and regional gaps. So our region gets no money. There's, there's a lot of articles like that, actually. Um, so this is kind of what I do manually, right? And then the idea is that then I use this to train the classifier. And perhaps really briefly in terms of how this work, if, if you're curious, we can talk more about this later. Um, I tried a whole set of um, algorithms actually. So I did, um, I've done naive base, SVM, uh, LDA and guided LDA, if that tells you anything, if not, I mean, that's fine. Um, the huge advantage of Naive Base is that it's one of the most popular algorithms. It's the algorithm that goes into your spam to classify email into spam or not, because it's remarkably accurate for with a very simple idea, which is very known to a lot of people about the base theorem, right? The probability of X conditional on Y. And this is kind of what I'm doing. So say I take this tweet, which is another example, that is saying something like the Church of St. Mary organizes some sort of Easter um, mass. And what I would be doing is I tell the algorithm, well, this is religion. And then this is this probability. So this is what I'm doing is maximizing the probability of the class. So the topic, given whatever documents I have. And to do so, what I calculate, this is based on the probability that the, that the document is actually religion. And this comes from my training set. It's very easy to calculate. And then what I'm doing is calculating the probability that I would find such a tweet, considering that the class would be religion, right? And the way that um, Naive Base does this, which is why it's called Naive, is because it's assuming two things. One, that word order doesn't matter. So whether Santa Maria comes first or Maria Santa is irrelevant. And also it's assuming that when I take the word Santa and I, I can multiply the probability of Santa, given that the topic is religion, times the probability of Maria, given that the topic is religion, etc. And this gives me a probability that I attach to a class. Um, hopefully this is, <laughs> this is somewhat clear. You can ask questions about this. Um, and this is remarkably easy if you think about it. And it does end up with 70% um, accuracy. The accuracy is actually higher for some other types of algorithms, but um, it helps in terms of sensitivity for the topics that I care about. So this one outperformed all of the others. So this is why I en ended up going for naive base. Um, okay, so let me go into maybe like the, the most logical part. So now that I have all of my tweets um, classified by topic, so I know what people are talking about and I know what the tweet what newspaper wrote the tweet. So now I have to attach them to a location. And so if I do, if I, let's say I take the example of La Línea de la Concepción, which is a municipality at the very south of Spain. And this is in, in uh, the province of Cádiz in Andalucía, which is the region. And I actually have information on readership for Andalucía. So I can tell you how many people read the different five national papers and how many people read um, local or regional papers. And I use this to assign weights. So La Línea de la Concepción gets five national papers and I attach those. One regional paper, three from the provinces and two local, one from La Línea and one from Algeciras. And what I do is simply use these readership numbers to weight um, the topic classifications. And the idea is that at the very end, I end up with a percent of the of the articles that belong to topic X, which is what you saw earlier. So something along the lines of whatever, 4% um, of articles are about immigration in La Línea de la Concepción. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. Now I know kind of everywhere in Spain um, what topic is more prevalent by location. And now this should become a bit simpler. Now we can ask the question, well, is it true that if I look at the actual statistic, does it match what the newspapers are saying? Um, and I find that, well, first I should show you this, yes. So these are the, the loadings for each of the different topics across the Spanish territory. I missed the canaries in there. Um, you, I find like as a Spanish person, I find this quite unsurprising. <laughs> 
as in, for example, there's a lot of poverty and unemployment here in the Northwest. I was not very surprised about that. Same in the topics of regional gaps. My parents are actually from this area. So I was, this is how I got the idea from the paper by reading all those articles. Um, what I found quite striking, and I'm going to talk about this a bit later, is the fact that feminism is very prevalent in an area where I would not expect it to be. And this is because there is an issue with the algorithm that I cannot solve, and this is a caveat kind of going forward, that I cannot assign sentiment. So those tweets are about, they talk about women and they talk about feminism or they talk about gay rights, but not necessarily in a positive manner. And this is something that I can't really, so currently the algorithm does not account for this and it's quite tricky. Um, the, this only shows up as a problem in the feminism case because there's clearly like a clear polarization there. Um, okay, so back to the comparison with reality. What happens if I take the topic loading for unemployment and poverty, so the share in particular places, and I compare it with the unemployment rate? And unsurprisingly, based on what the literature says that they cannot, there's this debate because they can't really find a relationship. And what I see is that there is no relationship between the unemployment rate and where newspapers talk about this. It's a pretty prevalent thing. There's quite a bit of heterogeneity across places, but this very much pushes for the idea that perhaps perceptions have really not that much to do with, um, with where you're actually seeing high levels of unemployment. Same thing happens with the cultural backlash argument. If I compare the loading on immigration, like the share of topics on immigration with the foreign born share, I see no relationship, but I see things that make a lot of sense. Like for example, Ceuta and Bahia del Getiras that are both places at the very south of Spain have a very high have a very high share of, to of articles on immigration. And this is because the topic might be very salient to people there, but the migrants might move elsewhere. They might move to Madrid, move to Barcelona, move to wherever it is that they're moving to, um, which is quite interesting again. However, this doesn't happen with the geography of discontent. So here, what I see, I look at, at the share, at the level of economic development, so how the different provinces have, have um, developed since 1955 until today. And what I see is that there's, there's exceptions. Uh, this bit on the right here that you can read very badly is the Canary Islands and Murcia that did much better than everybody else since the 50s, but somehow are still complaining about regional gaps. Um, but on the other side, we see very much that it actually does link to places like there's very high loadings of the topic of regional gaps on places that actually did develop far less since the 50s. So it seems to be justified. And this is the one topic where reality and, and the, the share of articles does actually seem to correlate accurately. Um, so now, once I know this, um, the question is, well, we can go back to the initial question of, OK, then how does this whole link up with, with the vote for the radical right? And what I'm going to do is something super simple. This is a simple OLS regression where I use population density and turnout as controls. And I am predicting whoops, sorry, the share of vote for Vox. And I am going to add um, an unemployment and poverty, the share of uh, articles on unemployment and poverty. And then there is another vector for uh, immigration, religion, and feminism. And then there is another vector that includes regional gaps and lack of resources. So the geography of discontent side. Um, and I just, and then there is just an error term. And I can show you the models both with regional controls and without regional controls. And what I see, it actually makes quite a bit of sense to add for to add regional controls because this would control for for all of these things that I was talking about earlier for example um, the Basque country or the Canaries having lower shares of the vote this is because there are distinct characteristics of those regions that are just different um, but when I do this you see a couple of surprising things so first of all population density goes in favor of Vox rather than against it and this is something that is a feature I think of only Spain um, and I double check this and it matches up with reality in the sense that actually, for example, in Madrid, in the capital, 15% of the vote went to Vox in the last election. And this is above the national average. So it's quite striking and something that doesn't happen in other places. Turnout, on the other hand, works the other way. And this is very much in line with the literature, this idea of maybe it's a protest vote kind of thing. And then you see things that are very unsurprising. Uh, we look at unemployment and poverty. Of course, it has a positive effect. 
and same with religion and immigration that joined together seem to be a bit stronger in effect. What is very striking is what I was saying earlier that feminism and LGBTQ issues go in the, the sign should be negative. So it should like an increase in, in the share of articles on feminism and LGBTQ should lower the rate of the, sh the share of vote for Vox. But it doesn't because of what I was saying, because when you look at it under closer scrutiny, a lot of these articles are very sexist is the word. Uh, some of it's very divergent. And this is something that I cannot really account for, right? Um, Similarly, a lack of resources, this is also very unsurprising, favors the rise of the radical right. But interestingly, the idea of regional gaps doesn't. And this is because it favors the mainstream right instead, rather than the radical right, which is interesting. So there is only partial, so in a nutshell, there is only partial confirmation of the geography of discontent idea but then there is confirmation of the other two. So both of the, econo the economic anxiety and the cultural backlash theory. Uh, and um, I wait, let me see. Okay, so just to conclude very quickly, I see all evidence for kind of all sides in the theoretical debate, although as I was saying, it's more partial for the geography of discontent and it seems like the cultural factors outweigh the economic ones, but this is very hard to say. And it's not, evidently, it's, it, I, I cannot say that with absolute certainty because this is just a regular OLS and I have no instruments of any kind. Um, and then, so kind of three things that, that perhaps you want to take away with this. First, the possibility of using quantitative text analysis in this way and of looking at perceptions from a higher level that is not just with individual level surveys, for example, and just seeing the preferences as they are, as they actually appear kind of in, in society. Um, and the ability of quantitative text analysis to analyze all this data, which is um, amazing. And in terms of an extension, dealing with this sentiment issue in the feminism category would be amazing. Uh, and extending it to time series. And the reason why I haven't done this is because Twitter blocked their access to, to mining their tweets um, recently. But um, those are two planned extensions. And I think, yeah, I think that's it. I don't know if you have any questions or comments. I think I kept it to half an hour. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, perfect timing. Uh, spot on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Beatriz. A very, very interesting presentation. Um, I have seen many, many questions in the chat. So um, does anyone uh, wants to ask uh, any questions uh, to Beatriz? Um, John, you were asking some questions. You Do you want to uh, elaborate some of them? Or? Thanks very much. Very, very interesting. Um, just a number of sort of practical questions. The, the tweets are based on on newspaper coverage to what extent and i just don't know this are the different newspapers in uh, in in spain politically aligned in the sense that their editorial policy and this is true in the uk their editorial policy is in a particular spectrum of politics and therefore what they are uh, their editorial policy affects what they're putting in their papers and then in turn what they're tweeting. So that's just an empirical question. I've got lots more questions, but can you help me on that one? Yeah, so uh, this is actually why I control this is I was very I found this really striking and very strange, actually. Uh, national papers have a very, very clear political slant. Like it's there's five national papers and it's really easy to say which one is right wing, which one is left wing. Regional papers don't which is quite interesting because they belong to some of the same media conglomerates across the country and there may be some type of slant but it's definitely not as clear and this is why i use newspaper readership because it splits each of the national papers with their readership by region and you see yeah. there's really vast differences across places yeah. um so so yes that is definitely an issue but i am actually able to capture some of this with okay. controlling for readership Thank you. Just to follow on, the, the other thing that I sort of noticed, um, and, and again, I may be wrong in seeing that, um, I, I think the, in the LBGBT sort of ed edition, it seemed to be that there was most 
um, sort of dispute in what looked like being uh, Catalonia, which I, I would understand is probably the more liberal part of, of, of Spain, mm -hmm. um, and where there will be perhaps more a stronger LGBT movement, which in turn is getting a reaction from uh, the conservative elements. So is there an element of, 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 of regional differences? And, and why this is important, if I put this to the UK context, um, clearly, you know, the woke wars are being driven out of, start in London, that's the most liberal place, and, and arguably Catalonia is the most liberal part of Spain. Um, and the backlash is coming from um, the rest of the country. Um, the cultural wars is a cultural war and it's creating huge political problems for, for example, the Labour Party. So to what extent is there a, you know, a, a differential in, 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 the which in, in degrees of liberalisation, which is getting backlash differentially from place to place? Um, that's a very naive question, but... Uh, so I... I would assume, and I don't know this, that cities would seem to be more liberal, like particularly on the feminist side. And this is in general. So the big actually gay centers in Madrid, not, not in Barcelona, but oh. I mean, they're both two very liberal places. But then what I found actually, it wasn't against LGBTQ, it was mostly against feminism that, that was the most striking when I did the analysis. And it is, I, I found this to be the case around, so kind of in the north around, it was very specific community. So it seemed to be Murcia and Aragon for like people who know where these are. It, it, so I, I, I really, I don't think that it's just like an urban rural situation. Um, it, it really seems to be certain regions and, and I, I, for the love of me, do not know why this is, but for sure it would correlate with the vote. But yeah, I don't have a good answer for this other than yes, you're right. There's definitely something like that there, but. My, my final comment, and again, it's sort of in implications for the sort of work that we do in the academy on regional analysis. It does seem to me that, it, that what is happening increasingly, certainly in the UK, is objective analytics are being displaced by the populism of politics in the media. And, and resource allocations, just to tell everyone, you know, you know we know that in the UK, uh, they've just cancelled the place fund in the government, and it's all going to be linked to the levelling up fund, and the levelling up funds are going to places which are, you know, fighting the, against the woke agenda, and are getting resources not related in any way to objective analysis, and that has implications for us in the academy, that the whole process of resource allocation is becoming increasingly politicized. Yeah, like I, I think this is happening all over the place. This is my, my read on this. And this is kind of what I'm saying, that the media is in part catering to what people want or people's opinions rather than saying, oh, these are the facts, FYI. And that definitely, it seems to be happening everywhere is my <laughs> assessment of this, but uh, yeah. Thanks, well, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll shut up now and ask other people ask questions. Thank you. Josh, uh, you want to ask a question? Hi, oh, yes. Uh, first of all, really enjoyed your presentation. I thought it was really interesting. And I um, that's a, good, a few takeaways for me to take away from that as well. Uh, I'm a data analyst at uh, City Ready as well. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you about your Twitter data. Mm -hmm. um, if um, So if you're analysing far-right groups with the extreme right... Um, are they at risk of breaking the Twitter guidelines and therefore being banned or something? So are they not being, is there a risk that they're not being part of the data collection? So um, I, since I use newspaper data, that is not that big of a okay. problem. But I, I actually don't think that they are because I started snooping around, like the tweets that I showed you were actually from the party. And as far as I can tell, they don't really get banned. <laughs> even though sometimes they say all sorts of outrageous stuff but I also I don't know because I haven't um kind of done a very systematic analysis of their like particular whatever their themes are I just did a word cloud and then came up with these tweets to kind of show you <laughs> that's really interesting oh, thanks I have a question by uh, Carlo Corradini. I think that uh, his internet is not very stable, so I'm going to read a question that is in the chat. Um, is there any 
an issue in newspaper readership variation. Uh, so he said, I guess some parts of the electorate uh, might have lower readership levels. Similarly, is the online equal to the paper content? Yeah, so that, that's actually a really good point. Uh, I was mostly worried actually about young versus old rather than rather than lower, lower yeah. educated rather than higher educated, because I have my, I mean, my impression and this is, I don't know this, this is my personal observation from what I see in Spain from where my parents are from. Uh, actually, a lot of um, people with lower levels of education read local papers. Would there, I was surprised by how prevalent they are. Like if, if you see the numbers, it's uh, crazy. And my own observation is that this seems to be correct. Um, coming from a family that doesn't have um, crazy high levels of education. But it is definitely true that there is an issue of online versus paper. And the only thing that I could do with this is that the data that I have is partly, so some of the papers, I actually do have online numbers for them particularly for the national ones, because they provide them. So they provide traffic. So I actually double checked that the numbers made sense. So I conducted a robustness check only using the national shares to see if the shares came up very different and they didn't. But indeed, this is a problem. And, I, and, and there, it may be the case that online um, completely, for example, national papers completely overshadow uh, local ones. Although this doesn't seem to be the case from what I see, like from the data that I have, but I can't rule that out. So yeah, that's a very fair point. Yeah. I don't know if that answers. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I have some questions as well. I, I don't know if, um, well, uh, Carlos, say thank you to you. Um, I don't know if there are many other questions, any other questions around. If not, I'm gonna ask some of them. Um, so, um, First of all, thank you very much. It's, it's very, very interesting. I think it's the way forward as well for um, you know the applied econometricians. I think that this is, is such a uh, such a uh, rich, uh, um, let's say, uh, richness in 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 using all the type of data also to illustrate what is happening uh, in a in a faster uh, path that uh, use. Uh, uh, standard uh, statistics. Um, so I think that uh, congratulations for that. I think that you have done it very well. Um, okay, uh, I think that uh, thinking about the geography of uh, this content, I think one of the main issues is that when we are using uh, regional data, um, we uh, tend sometimes to do not take into consideration the within uh, inequalities. Uh, in, uh, so many times, uh, uh, there is a lot of discontent in, in parts of, uh, for instance, Barcelona or in parts of Madrid, but it is not really well captured when we are using just a control for Madrid or, you know, or things like that. So I, I was interested, so I had that question and then I saw the econometrics that you in, include that regional gaps. Um, and I wanted to understand better because I think that, or oh, I have missed it, or you haven't explained very well uh, how that uh, variable has been constructed. Uh, and also I realized that, uh, uh, um, I don't know if it was uh, extremely consistent when you have included the controls or not uh, in terms of the sign and the significance. So maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, um, so wait, I can maybe show back because it, it does. Yeah, please do, because it, I'm also having yeah, a question on another slide, sign. so it, that will help me. Yeah, so it does swap sign exactly because of the reason that you were saying. So regional gaps is just a, it, it's another share of articles that basically say, there's a lot of articles that you will be familiar with saying, Valencia gets no resources from like from the central government or stuff like our region is being depopulated. There is no people in our area. All of these articles kind of fit into these regional gaps and it can be gaps of um, any kind. Uh, and I did have a bit of trouble in the algorithm because the lack of resources and regional gaps categories sometimes are not um, super distinct. And this is why I tried to separate them um, to, to make it a bit more precise. But you see that it swaps, once I add the regional control, it swaps sign completely, precisely because of what you were saying that maybe there, there is like discontent that comes from like far back and people are complaining, I mean, they are complaining about it but it might not necessarily be related to a current discontent. Maybe it's something that is just there about the region. And this, like Catalonia would be a very good example of this, but I feel like this happens kind of across the board that, that there's long-standing issues 
um, definitely, this is definitely the case where my parents are from in the Northwest, that it's also very prevalent and it's something that comes from like far, far, far back. Yeah, thank you very much. This is what I, I also saw. Um, um, I was also thinking about how much discussion is going on nowadays in, uh, in Spain, also here in the UK about housing. Um, uh, and how much is about, uh, you know, uh, renting versus uh, owning. And we know that in, in the case of Spain, housing always has been one of the main investments of the majority of uh, households. So um, I wonder if you have captured also uh, housing somehow in, um, because a lot, I mean, in, in, in Catalonia, you have a huge uh, um, discussions uh, daily about uh, housing and the rental market and how the discontent of so many uh, um, associations also um, promoting you know they are even neighborhood associations you know um, so I, I wonder if, if this is somehow controllable yeah so it that one falls under the unemployment and poverty category so anything that says living individual living conditions i've put under the economic argument um, but yeah, I, I'm actually writing another paper on this, on, on, on kind of on the effect of, of the yeah. college premium and how housing and where you live affects young people and how young people are like do fare far, far worse than anybody else on this. But yeah, this is like an entirely different paper on labor data. Yeah, that would be fascinating. Another question is about uh, Teruel. So my uh, the parents of my mom were from Teruel, and I have spent all my summers in Teruel. Even now, with my British husband and my uh, half British uh, son, we go to Teruel every summer. And in the geography of discontent, that um, uh, 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 non-linear uh, relationship that you found, Teruel is right in the middle, completely like an outlier. So. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, what do you think why that is happening? Oh, let me see. I actually had not even looked at Teruel <laughs> for people. But Teruel exists. Uh, so Teruel it was like, uh, a party. But yeah, it was Teruel a slogan uh, about uh, that uh, Teruel is a, is a kind of a low density area in the middle of uh, Spain. Okay. So uh, this weather conditions, uh, nobody knows about Teruel, and it was a political slogan in the past, uh, Teruel exists, and uh, and yes, uh, uh, so that is there, and he's right in the middle, and um, yeah, so I, I uh, would probably classify it together with Avila, Palencia, and Zamora, who are also very high on like the complaints kind of side, um, but apparently Teruel has done better since 1955 than Zamora, for example. So I, so I guess, I mean, it yeah, is indeed. in the, I find this very unsurprising as well, to be honest, that Teruel is complaining about regional gaps. It seems in line. I with... probably have to discuss this with your uh, PhD supervisor, Andres Rodriguez Fosse, uh, and uh, his uh, left behind uh, places. Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> Teruel is really, definitely... really <laughs> illustrates very, very, very well. Um, yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I probably the, the, the last suggestion is, 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 is maybe why don't you reproduce this uh, for the case of Catalonia and some of the things raised by, by John will come up. So instead of uh, looking at um, uh, looking at municipalities and, uh, and, and then it will be maybe interesting to see how uh, what is happening in Barcelona and the area of Barcelona. So you have also areas uh, uh, LGTV like uh, Sitges, very, very uh, close to Barcelona, where uh, the gay population is very, very high, the income is extremely high. And uh, so I, I, I guess that also you will have that. Um, it's not uh, urban rural, that is what I was always uh, commenting about. It doesn't anything to do with urban rural, it's more Barcelona versus the rest. And, and also how much uh, the municipalities of South Barcelona somehow were supporting uh, Puig de Mon uh, to use, uh, uh, you know, go forward to the independence. So uh, uh, I think it, it, it would be very, very interesting if you can do the same for the case of Catalonia. That would be so interesting. The thing here is that uh, a lot of the papers, so because there's a lot of small papers like Diario de Tarrasa and there's Sabadell and there's, and all of these are actually sold kind of across the, like there's pa the main paper, I mean La Vanguardia, that is the main national paper, um, is sold kind of everywhere, but also those overlap different areas. So I think I wouldn't actually see the variation because I did think about this as well for, for the case of Madrid. 
but it's it, it's very tricky to do with this data because papers are sold across different areas. So then, I mean, I, I would be able perhaps to estimate right at the border, but I maybe maybe I need to think about this. Maybe there is a way that I can do something like this because it would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah uh, lovely to to just collaborate with you if that is any interest of uh, thinking the way forward on that. I, I would be very interesting to see what is coming out from uh, even the illustration of uh, of uh, the, the descriptions of the tweeters. Uh, that is itself very interesting. Yeah. Um, Josh, do you have any other question? Yeah, just another quick question. Sorry, I was talking to Martin. <laughs> That's all right. Now, it's, I'm more interested from a computer science point of view as well. Like what um, lang computer language did you use and what um, modules did you use to do the machine learning? I'm, I'm just using Quantita in R. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought it'd be R. I use, I, use I use Python and TensorFlow for, for mine, but um, I don't know much so much of the R side of things, so that was really interesting. I have the opposite problem. I don't really know anything about Python, so <laughs> I do what I get. Actually, the mining of the data was a pain because, <laughs> because I don't do Python, and I had to like somehow modify somebody else's code, and that, that, it was a mess. But uh, thankfully, I made it. That was the <laughs> the complicated part, really. But yeah, Quantita. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh let me see what... can, yeah. can i have another one hey, John? yeah, yeah I, it, I, i'm totally yeah. fascinated and more from a sort of not from a quantitative analysis but a political science i mean the, what you were touching on is the extent to which these movements then influence mainstream conservative parties that's happening across europe you know it's happening in germany it's happening in the uk with the conservative party so you're seeing a a process that is going from the fringe and affecting some of the core uh, traditional conservative parties um and and you, as you quite rightly said Bish, it, it is not just a spanish phenomenon it's, it's a, a pretty global phenomenon um and it has pretty important relevance for, for us who are working on uh, issues of une uneven regional development and, and how, how one can uh, handle all of this stuff. Because potentially, and I did put this in the chat, some of this tech approach could be predictive. In other words, you know, not looking at what has happened in the sense that you are picking up trends which might then influence mainstream political movements. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do think that's extremely interesting. Um, way back, I remember reading a stuff, a, a, an American uh, a guy who wrote a book called Megatrends. And basically what he was picking up was analyzing newspapers to pick up social trends mm -hmm. at a local level, which became national political trends in the US. This was before digital technology. And I do think we've done work on mega trends in 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 a city ready, um, looking at uh, you know future trends and the development of the city. I do think this sort of analysis, and I flagged this up for colleagues in City Ready, I do think this is something that we should be thinking about doing. We've got skills in Josh and his team to do large scale data analysis, um, but largely of quantitative data and not narrative data. And I do think these narratives, which are the title of your paper, are incredibly important. They, they just spread and they then become part of the mainstream. So I do think you're touching on something. And I'm really glad I listened into you, which is really quite an important you know, trend that we in the regional development world needs to take take note of. So I don't have a, a concrete answer to it, but I would talk to college in, in, in City Ready to think about what this means for the sort of work we're doing here. Um, and if you just read, if you read the left-leaning newspapers, I read uh, 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 the New Statesman, which is a, a, a British magazine, which is talking about the crisis in the Labour Party, you know, because it's metropolitan. The issue that's going on at the moment, the culture wars in the UK are being waged about, universe by the university, culture wars are top of the agenda politically at the moment uh, for the government, a attacking museums, galleries, football, absolutely everything. And it's culture wars and it's and it's being uh, uh, developed on the back of social media, but it's being driven by a right wing conservative government that wants to win seats amongst a certain set of people. So this is not this is just me talking abstract political stuff, but it does seem to me that there's 
there's a lot of interesting stuff that you've, you've touched on here, which is way beyond the, my, uh, my, I'm not a political scientist, but I just you know, observing what's going on. So I, I think, you know, thanks very much. It's been a really stimulating uh, conversation. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you agree, because that is basically what I'm saying, that we should be watching newspapers for narratives. The thing is that Twitter now has made it harder because now you have to pay for their data and all of a sudden this gets really expensive. That's why I'm only doing it for the year right before the elections. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's gotten a bit trickier, but maybe Josh can find another like way of mining this through Python that is not the one that I used. You, um, if you're on about the API, yeah, it's difficult yeah. at the moment with Twitter. The, I've written a web scraping script that does the same. Um, the only problem with that is it can break after a while as Twitter updates their page. So it's not, yes, keep rewriting it, but it's it's difficult. <laughs> I, I know the pain you've gone through. <laughs> what is what I use is the Selenium, is it the Selenium package in Python that just loads the page over and over and over and over? Yeah, yeah so I've used Selenium um, for a bit uh, to automate the JavaScript. The um, You can do it to open fields, so all, all of the elements and the items on the page. There's also an element that, um, I tend to run these things overnight because they, they can be quite, I have to, you have to put a sleep time frame in to make, as you probably know, to make sure you're not overloading the server. And then you have to put some parameters in to make it think that you're more human-like. Um, so Selenium I use to randomize clicks and things to make it think that I'm on a web page like that. And it's quite fascinating. When you run it out of headless mode, you, you can almost see it going along and it looks very human-like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, you you had so much to do in sort of your research, like that in itself could be a project in terms of like scraping Twitter. But there's a, I've got an upcoming project where I'm looking to do it. Probably not on the same sort of scale you you've been doing, but starting out a bit a bit lower down where I'm, I'm trying to, because APIs are, are, are difficult. Yeah, I'm seeing that Carlo is saying that there is a free academic access now. Yes. That would make my life a lot easier. Oh. Is it yeah, like yeah, I've just been opening that. that. Sorry, I don't know if you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but my internet connection is not great uh, today yes. for some reason. So yes, I think that in January this year, they opened up this new track access. I, I'm applying at the moment. I'm not sure how easy it is, but in theory, it should also allow you to have like, access to old tweeters. So. Like a, yeah. you, you can get time series and stuff like that, but and yeah. 10 million observations per month you can download, so it's huge. That's really good because that is literally the problem I was having that I had to like get around all of these Twitter things because it only lets you download the last seven days, I think it is, um, through their API, like through their normal methods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, again, I'm not sure how because you look on their web page, it seems very interesting, but I, I'm, I still don't have access, so I'm not sure whether it would be that good, but you know, it's worth w browsing. I mean, yeah, thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's an opportunity for someone in to follow up in, in City Ready. <laughs> Yeah, there's like a lot of downloading. This is, I can see my supervisor selling me to write another paper. <laughs> I I, I've just copied the link. <laughs> for your time series. Um, yeah, um, for the time series that I currently don't have. Yeah. Yes, then that would be very good. Okay, so um, uh, I think that if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, close this session today. Um, just as we normally say to uh, all of uh, our presenters, just first, thank you very much for having the time to present your research on our uh, external seminar series. And secondly, uh, hopefully very soon, if everything goes back to normal, we will be able to just uh, uh, invite uh, everybody who has presented to come along to the Institute and meet the people face to face and maybe start uh, collaborations uh, um, with other institutions. So um, yeah, so hopefully we will do that very, very soon. Um, thank you everybody who has uh, come today uh, to listen to Beatriz. And uh, thank you very much again, Beatriz, for um, having uh, presented today. Uh, at City Ready Seminar Thank series. you for having me. Um, to all of you, just enjoy the weather. If you are in the in the UK, the weather is nice today. So it's probably is our summer. <laughs> so um, enjoy the weather and, uh, and see you soon.